right, let's see if I can turn that round. There we are, got there in the end. Brilliant. <laughs> Sorry about my technological um, compromises there, but uh, anyway, uh, YouTube managed to confuse me very, uh, very well once again. Anyway, uh, good to see you. I'm kind of new to this sort of thing. Uh, my name is Nick Baker. Um, I'm a naturalist and a broadcaster. Um, I am a lifelong naturalist. I've been doing this since I could crawl. I've been obsessed with all living things, which I guess, to use a phrase coined by the great entomologist uh, and ecologist E.O. Wilson, um, incidentally the only person I've ever been starstruck in the presence of, uh, he coined the phrase biophile, and that's how I would probably describe myself best. Um, I am a professional naturalist, so I make my living leading tours and writing books and doing TV and sometimes radio. Um, but I still consider myself part of that long heritage of uh, English um, Englishmen, English women, English people. Um, and I'm, an, I'm an amateur naturalist. Um, I still have that same uh, wonder for the living world as I did when I was first let out on my own as a kid. So today I am sitting in a small, scrappy, kind of forgotten piece of woodland um, around the back of my allotments. I live about 150 yards away. Um, there are houses through the trees that way, so there may be the odd uh, machine, the odd mower, strimmer, hammer, that sort of thing. Um, but I come here quite a lot because it's a nice place to reflect. It's a woodland. Um, and I love woodlands, especially at this time of year in the spring. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, I guess, how I immerse myself as a naturalist, as a field naturalist. My only skills really, I'm, it, are, I'm able to find things, and able to see things and observe things. Um, I've tried writing on CVs when I've applied for ecology jobs, but it just doesn't seem to hold the weight that it should. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, I guess, it's the zen of of natural history. It's the Zen of being. It's the Zen of seeing. It's the, it's tuning your senses and your sensibilities into your landscape um, in order to see, find, experience um, the best of the world. So I'm going to start with this idea that um, lots of people come, they pay money to come on trips with me. Uh, I still don't understand this, <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, what they're paying me for is what I think everybody should be able to do. It's just somewhere along the line, like a lot of us, we've become disconnected with this world, the world of nature, the green spaces, because most of us don't make a living directly from it anymore. Um, if we did, we'd know which plants were toxic, which plants would uh, salve, uh, you could use as a salve, which plants you could use as a toothpick or a best to light fires. And I know a lot of us have bits of this information, but once upon a time this was common knowledge um, and it is slowly being lost. And for me, when people ask me or tell me, how did you notice that? How did you see that butterfly? Or how did you spot the stick insect or the, uh, whatever it is, uh, whichever part of the world we're in? I, I struggle to answer the question because I just notice it. I notice it like people notice the brands of cars or designer labels on trainers or, or even the thudding bass line or, um, in a car that whizzes so I sometimes um, do this stuff. Um, and what I, the way I look to think of it is most of us move too fast. So the first thing you want to do, if you want to see nature and really experience it, is move slower. That's number one, move slower. The faster you go, the larger what I call your hemisphere of influence is. So if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're going for a walk, it's this big. As you, as you run, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. If you take a dog with you, which is also running, it gets bigger still. And then there's a, there's a jump on um, a little bit further. So I just saw Jay fly through. So I'm very distracted. This is the problem with this subject. Um, it's very difficult to focus. But as uh, you move faster, your sphere of, or hemisphere of influence gets bigger because obviously you're not really influencing the things under your feet quite so much. But if you slow down, it shrinks. And if you stop, it becomes almost nothing. If I stayed very, very still and just sat here all day, things would walk past. I'd have a fox walk past or a badger, maybe even a deer. 
uh, birds will fly over my head. This is how it works. So that's the first thing. We move too fast, so slow right down and things become very apparent. So my, my, what I do if I want to get to know a habitat, I have to tune into it first. So this is my habitat. This is where, um, this is the landscape or the, certainly the species that I grew up with. So this is like my family. I recognise all the plants and the trees um, and the songs of the birds like I would the voices and the faces of my family. Um, so the first thing is, is to become that familiar with all this. Now, initially, and being a naturalist, often uh, surrounded by lots of jargon. It can be quite uh, mysterious. Um, access can be quite difficult for some if you're just getting into it. So the first thing you need to do is forget all that. Forget all the equipment snobbery. Forget having the right clothes and the right brands. It's got nothing to do with that. Get away from the idea that you need to uh, have some kind of guru-esque qualities to be able to decipher the sounds. Naming things, okay, it's part of the story, but that comes later. You don't have to know the name of something to appreciate its aesthetic, its beauty. So first thing I do is sit myself down and just shut up. Now, I'm not going to do that right now because I've obviously got to talk to you. But right now I'm in my woodland and I start with my ears. Because of my eyes, I'm, I'm bamboozled all the time by the play of light off the leaves. And beautiful though it is, it's not my first sense. My first sense is my ears. So I'm listening. I can hear alarm calls of blackbirds up there probably because they've got youngsters. I did see a young bird bouncing through the bushes earlier on. Um, I've got a robin with his cheer cheery little song just above my head. There's a blackbird singing over there. There's a chiff chaff over there. There's actually a black cap calling over there. So that's the first thing, the bird song. Now this could be just as easily be insect song, or if I was in another country, this could be, well, you, oh, we do have mammals that make noises, but they're a bit shy during the day. But uh, if I was in the tropics, it could be something else. It could be a gibbon. It could be um, something uh, making some territorial roar or grunt, you know. All these things are clues. They all tell me and reassure me that these life forms are here. But then it goes further than that. Trees are creaking. I can hear squirrels running up the trees themselves. I can actually hear the sound their claws make on the bark. And then I can hear, because I'm in a woodland, the whole woodland floor is coated with dead leaves, which means I can hear everything that touches the dead leaves. And this, I mean, this time of day, I'm not going to hear a huge amount. There might be the squirrel, there'll be the birds foraging, and the rhythms, the sounds they make, they create rhythms. Now, all this stuff is, you don't, all you've got to do is put the time in. Just sit there and drink it in. And you learn very slowly over time. You start off with the sounds, you go, know, what's that, what's that, I can hear it. If you stay still long enough, you will see it, it will reveal itself. You really need to spend time in a habitat like this for it to give up its secrets. Um, woodlands are probably one of the more difficult, so woodlands and forests um, and any vegetation um, which is quite dense, where it's a re it could be a reed bed as well, are actually probably some of the most challenging places because um, you are limited very much, your field of vision is, is very much closed in, which is useful at one level because you can focus on what's near to you, but uh, often you can hear something moving not very far away, but you can't see it and it's very frustrating, but it does help you train your senses on it. Um, so all these, these clues, I mean, open habitats, like estuaries and grasslands and that, are sort of, I guess, are easier because you can see further, but you don't need to decipher them in quite the same way. It's a little bit easier. We use our eyes a lot more in the places like this. But I think if you're going to train your senses, find yourself a nice dense patch of woodland, a thicket, somewhere like that, and just sit there and, and slowly let it come to you, because it will come to you. I know. Uh, just by experience that, and, and I know this is my local patch, so I pass through it all the time, I know that there are at least seven roe deer in the very close vicinity where I'm sitting. There's definitely grey squirrels, countless numbers of grey squirrels. There are countless numbers of wood mice and bank voles. Um, there's even door mice here as well. And it's a case of, you know that they're just passing, they're here somewhere, and they will be 
passing through this area. There goes a blackbird. Unfortunately, he didn't come in front of the camera, he just went behind it. But all these animals are passing through. So if you stay still long enough, like this tree, I always like to play games with myself and imagine what this tree would have seen um, just by standing here in its, I don't know, hundred and something odd year life. What's it seen? What animals have rubbed up against it? What things have climbed in its branches? And, and that's how it starts. You start piecing together this, uh, this sort of uh, picture. Um, often I'll sit here with my, uh, my, ears, my ears shut. No, never with my ears shut, always with my eyes shut. Um, and I will listen through the landscape. Um, when I was a kid, um, I got an album. Um, not a normal album by any means. I still got it somewhere. I forgot what it's called, but it was a um, any English uh, folk watching will be very familiar with uh, Johnny Morris. He was a big name uh, back in the early 70s and uh, 60s and early 70s. Um, and he was very famous for doing his animal impressions and uh, putting kind of voices or uh, voices into animals' heads. Um, trying to characterise and popularise these animals that way. And there was an album which was all about living in a street full of animals. And it described waking up, in the, you know, lying there in your bed in the morning and just listening to everything going on in the house. You know, your dad getting up and gargling in the bathroom and then they'd, they'd put a walrus over the top of that and then you'd hear the fallow deer kick-starting his, his scooter in the, in the street outside. And I kind of took this literally... Um, I would lie there in bed and as an exercise I'd sit there and try and identify as many birds as I possibly could before I got up just by using my ears. But equally I'd like to try and plot just by the sounds they're making where every individual in my family was within the house. You know, where were they in their sort of um, morning ritual as it were. And in some ways I train myself to be able to do that in nature and that's pretty much what I do to this day. Um, so that's sort of how you use your ears. You can sort of listen through everything, but then your eyes come in because your ears give you almost that kind of 360 vision because obviously your head is mobile, you can hear things, and then you can turn to see it. And that's how your, um, uh, that's how your, your, your ears and eyes work together in, in, in harmony like that. So eyes are brilliant, obviously. We are visual monkeys. We don't need to be reminded there, but sometimes we kind of don't use them right. We just... We get distracted, we whiz about, we see pretty flower maybe, but that's about it. But if you sit still, your view is limited. So again, you're not moving around and distracting yourself. So you've got pretty much what you've got in your peripheral vision. Um, so you can know, you can work out what your peripheral vision is by just opening your hands out until you can't see them either side if your head's pointing forward. And once you've got that, that is pretty much your screen. That's what you're looking at. And you can kind of play around with it and you can see, let's count the number of species in there. Try and look at the world differently. Look at it in a way that, um, imagine, use your imagination. Zoom into things, zoom into a leaf, trying to work out. Can you, see a, can you see a blemish on that leaf? Has that leaf got something on it? In fact, I'm just doing it right now and I've noticed there's one, two, three, four, five aphids sitting on the underside of a sycamore leaf up there. So straight away, I've got an understanding of that sycamore leaf is perfect at this time. It's only just unfurled, but it's not gonna be perfect for much longer because those things are feeding on it that chiff chaff that's singing over there will also be feeding on these things. So straight away, I'm tuning into an energy cycle. I've just been bitten by a mosquito, <laughs> another energy cycle. So you, you start tuning in and that's, that's why you train your eyes. Don't try and um, try and find patterns, try and find um, stories with your eyes. Um, again, I'm sitting here and I've noticed that the tree in front of me, which is a very tired old sycamore, or young sycamore in fact, has all sorts of signs on it. It's got stories, it's had its bark stripped at some point. Now, I would say that's been stripped by a roe deer because the bark is stripped quite low down. Um, but a bit further up there's some nibbles, there's a dead branch there. Why is that branch dead? What, what, what has caused that die off? All these are stories, and the more you explore them, the more you question them, the more you investigate them, the bigger your knowledge bank is, the more you build on it. Um, then you've got your other senses, your sense of smell. When I walk through a new habitat, or even an old, even a habitat I'm familiar with, I will often grasp leaves as I go, and I'll crush them up. Obviously, you've got to be careful you're not <laughs> crushing up something that's uh, very, very spiky or, or bad for you in some way. Um, and smell it. 
you are smelling the, the, the real essence. I know this sounds, all like, sounds like a lot of hippie nonsense, I know, but this is it, what it's about. You will smell that smell some other time. It, it may be released when you get rain for the first time after a dry period, and suddenly you'll recognise which, which um, plants are lending themselves um, to your experience. So that's what I do. I, I do this, I smell it. Um, equally, um, I will join up the smells of a place with the sounds and the sights, and to a lesser extent, the taste. Our, our, uh, our sense of taste isn't so good. I will feel stuff as well. Our sense of touch is very useful. But what this does, rather than, we live in a, a Google generation where you, you basically look, look all the information up. I often get asked questions like, what's this? Or how do you do this? Um, I will be denying you all that wonderful, delicious self-discovery if I told you the answer, because you'll give up, that's it, you've got the answer, sorted. It's human nature. But if you're working hard for it, and if you are walking through an environment, or sitting like I am today, smelling, hearing, seeing things properly, like as far as your senses will take you, then what you're doing is linking up all these experiences in your brain. You are creating neural pathways. Many of them be new. It's like learning a new language um, or a, a new musical instrument. It's all about muscle memory. It's about forming new neural connections. But that's also how memories form as well. So um, whereas you might be completely gobsmacked by someone who can name every single bird that's firing off all around you, you it's not rocket science. All it requires is time. Immerse yourself in it. Connect up as many of your senses as you possibly can. Um, and I, could, I, could, I bet you, you could come to a place like this and you could sit here and immediately put yourself, not only um, in, you could imagine the entire habitat without even being here. You could just lie in bed and you just need one of these cues and it'll take you straight back to this place. Um, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and that happens the world over. Um, wherever you go, uh, wherever I travel, I try and take time to drink in the uh, the local habitats, especially if they're new ones to me, because I know that I won't start making sense of them until I can start doing that thing. Some people, I think the new parlance for this particular behaviour is, is woodland bathing, um, which I think makes it sound it's just as easy, it is as easy as jumping in, but uh, you don't you don't get out of the water, that's the difference, so you, you carry on, it becomes part of you. Um, and. What it does, particularly in the moment with, uh, with lockdown the way it is, it is a brilliant way of getting everything in perspective. It's really good. I believe it's Mental Health Week this week. So if you are struggling with stresses and strains and worries, like I am, like we all are in some way, then doing this, sitting down quietly somewhere in nature, you calm down that inner monkey, you calm down... Um, the being inside of you. Because most of our history, most of our human evolution, we have been hunter-gatherers. We've been dependent on this stuff all around us. It's only in recent years we've created this protective bubble. So for me, it's about finding that inner hunter-gatherer, that, uh, that salvation um, from within um, by taking yourself into a quiet place. Now, it could just be a garden. It could be the park. It could be staring at a plant in a window. But it doesn't really matter. But all of these things I'm talking about, they all satisfy your soul in some way. It's real. The problems the world's having at the moment isn't real. It's, it's, it affects our world, our species, but it doesn't affect, uh, certainly not in a negative way, anything else. So if you want reassurance that the world keeps turning and the world is still a great place, then just find yourself a little bit of nature. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I'm going to plug, because um, obviously I'm, I, I ramble a lot. I'm just one of those people. I have a butterfly mind. My brain is all over the place. I need nature to organise my thoughts. That's, <laughs> that's another thing. Um, I've written all, a lot of this stuff down. I'm, I'm, I think I'm allowed to plug. No one's told me not to. Um, obviously it's back to front because I'm using the wrong side of the, my phone, but that's typical. It's a book called Rewild. Don't be put off by the name. It's, um, it's all about using um, and connecting to your... Your, your nature. It's about fine-tuning your sensibilities. And if you want to follow me, I do a little Instagram broadcast live most mornings. It's nine o'clock at the moment. Um, I'm on Instagram at nick underscore bug underscore baker. 
um, and I'm on Twitter at BugBoyBaker. That's a reflection of my passion for the little things with many legs. So hopefully um, that is um, all good stuff. Hopefully that made sense to you. And hopefully it was some kind of a lesson. I hope it wasn't uh, too obvious or too patronising. But sometimes I think um, the solutions to some of the biggest problems on, in the world um, are easily missed because they are so simple. Um, and sitting out in nature, like I'm doing right now, I think cures quite a lot of them. And of course, once you're valuing it, you look after it. So I think that's it from me. Um, there'll be another live lesson tomorrow. <laughs>